All right, it's time to get started. Yep, so we're we're on live, and um, so thank you for joining us at 2.30 today. We're live with Bobby Farley's Rubio for a little What's Up Tonight Skies, <laughs> and uh, I think there's something exciting you want to share. I, I was looking, it looks a little uh, cloudy. <laughs> well, well, it's actually not so much tonight, but especially tomorrow night, but tonight will be almost good enough. Uh, we are having a full moon. And it is the full buck moon. And I thought I would help address why it gets that funny name. Um, but tonight is not the full moon. It's going to be tomorrow night. And today and tomorrow, we have really nice warm weather. So this might be the first moon that comes up when it's hot at night, which means you probably will be outside, hopefully enjoying your Friday night, uh, maybe sitting by a bonfire, hopefully doing something nice like barbecuing or just enjoying the evening sunset. And you'll see in the sky, the rising full moon. Tonight, you will see a almost full moon. It's a waxing gibbous. And if you don't know the rhythms of the moon, you have to understand that the full moon won't be up until the sun actually sets. And tonight, the moon will actually be up before the sun sets. So there's your visual cue that it's not quite the full moon yet. But I also want to address the fact that if you look at the full moon, and this is a full moon specific thing, it is telling you exactly where the sun will be six months from that time. So there's an important thing to think about now because we're in the month of June. We are only a couple of weeks away from the longest day of the year, the summer solstice. And that means that six months from that date will be exactly the winter solstice. So to put all of these dates and numbers together, I hope this is not getting confusing. This is not as esoteric as it might sound. The full moon in June is telling you where the sun will be in December. Look at it that way. And so tonight's full moon will be low in the sky. And just like how the sun behaves in December, it rises in the southeast, doesn't get very high up in the south, and sets in the southwest. That is what the, this full moon is going to do. So if at any time you see that full moon tomorrow night, even tonight, you can say, that's going to be where the sun is in December. And when you see how low it is in the horizon, that's one of the best things about full moons in the summer. They're low on the horizon instead of way up high. So you get more of the tinting of the atmosphere. You get some of those effects. And it, it adds to the fun. And since it's warm out and you're probably outside already, hopefully, you're more likely to enjoy these rising full moons in the warm months. And they're always low on the horizon. So these are some of the hopeful red rhythms that if you start to observe this all over your lifetime, you'll start to realize it will make it easy for you to understand the full moon. So let's get into Stellarium. We can show you that. Oh, I can't share yet, Leela. I, I need that ability. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Now I have the power to share my screen. So Stellarium. All right. And those of you who haven't been with us before is free software, Stellarium.org. And it allows you to simulate everything that's going to happen in the night sky, even into the future. So I'm going to use it to advance to tonight's sunset. And tonight's sunset is not until 8.27. Think of that. There won't be a sunset until nearly 8.30. And since twilight lasts about 90 minutes, that means it won't get close to fully dark until 10 p.m. tonight. Well, there goes the sun. Now, remember, I know you're looking at the sun, but I want to talk about the moon. So let's notice that the sun will still be up in the sky when we first get our chance to see the moon. Ah. There, the sun has not quite set, well, almost. And you can see that the moon is a little less than 100 degree, 180 degrees away from where the sun is. And if I press a button with Stellarium, I can jump forward exactly one night or just do it through here. And if I push this to the June 5th, tomorrow night, you'll see that, whoop, aha, that moon will now be exactly 180 degrees apart from where the sun. That's what makes it the true full moon. That's what makes it look fully bright, but you can see that the difference between tomorrow night and tonight is not a huge difference. So most people think of the full moon as being a three-day range. Astronomers think of it as a very precise date, but I, I think, just imagine, it's the, the day before the full moon, the day of the full moon, and the day after, you will still think it looks full. So let me put the ground back into the picture. Tonight, you'll see the moon before the sun is fully set. Tomorrow night, again, I'll just 
advanced, you'll see the moon is invisible yet at this time. So that's what difference one single day makes. And then to combine it with something that we've been mentioning many times in our previous planetarium shows, the line that I just made appear is the ecliptic, the zodiac line. It does go through the famous 12 constellations that astrologers use for predicting the future. Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra are visible now. And notice that the moon is right where the claws of the scorpion are. And if you've been tuning into our previous planetarium shows, you'll know that the scorpion constellation is associated with Champ here, according to the folklore of the Abenaki Nation, the first Vermonters. So there's a lot of cool stories that we can tell, but the moon is going to be right next to Champ's head or the scorpion's claws tonight and tomorrow night the moon will be closer to a new constellation so let's see what we will see when this actually sets and this line by the way notice that the sun is right on this line the ecliptic the zodiac line so if you put all these weird numbers that i've made uh together let's put this to tomorrow night there is the moon 100 degrees from the sun. If you know that it takes the Earth a year to make its nearly circular orbit around the sun, 180 degrees is half of that. You know, the, I won't go into the ancient math. Why we have 360 degree circles is based on the calendar. But so the moon is exactly where the sun is going to be half a year away, half a year from now, six months from now. So that moon is the winter sun. I hope. That's not confusing. Let me stop talking about it and just show you what it'll look like tonight. So this is tomorrow night. This is tonight, June 4th. Advancing time with Stellarium is as easy as pushing the L key. And when you go a little farther through time, oh, oh gosh, I went too fast. Sorry, folks. I'm going to do that more slowly again, because I do want to mention that it's still not too late to see planet Mercury although that window of opportunity is closing fast. And those of you who have been watching these previous broadcasts know that that tree in the West is always in the wrong spot for seeing Mercury, but we'll see where we can see it tonight. So let's go a little more quickly through the twilight. And there, before it gets totally dark, there is planet Mercury. So those of you blessed with a great Western view might have a chance to see it below the two heads of the Gemini twins, the stars known as Pollux and Castor. And now remember, if you've been watching since uh, the spring, that's a winter constellation that we still can see on the beginning of summer, the, at the cusp of summer. But Mercury is going to be near the Gemini twins aheads. That might be the best way to find it. Look below. Um, and if you remember Venus, that was sparkling in the sky, taking up so much attention earlier this season. Well, check it out. Venus is now so close to the sun that you'd go blind looking for this planet. And it's actually on the other side of the sun. Venus is doing its really quick pass that it does in between us and the sun. It takes roughly 50 days where we can't see it. And then it starts to emerge, guess when? In the early mornings. So at the end of summer, you're gonna start seeing Venus in the morning before sunrise, just like you were seeing Venus in the evenings after sunset. And Mercury is not gonna be there much longer. In fact, if I just go quickly through the next few days, you'll see, do, 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 do. Mercury is diving back towards the sun and we're going to lose sight of it by next week. So take, take your, uh, your opportunity to see Mercury now. This is probably the best time, partly because it's in Gemini and Gemini is on the high part of the Zodiac. This is one of the best times in my lifetime to see Mercury. So get out there soon. Don't miss it. But let's go back to that moon on the other side of the sky. So I'm going to advance time a little further. It's still twilight, but you can already see Antares, the not Mars star. That is the heart of the Scorpion constellation and the brightest one. So the moon will be right above Antares. And these three stars here are, in my opinion, what make the head of the champ Gitaskog picture from the Abenaki folklore. But let's go on a little later into the night. So now we're getting past midnight, but I just wanted to make it possible for you to see the entire Scorpion constellation. The illustration that Stellarium provides is pretty good for matching up with the stars. And you have to tune into 
previous shows if you want to learn more about the Abenaki version. I'll go into it again, but I just did that last uh, co last couple of weeks. So, where's the moon going to be when it's actually full? You might be thinking this is tonight. Well, tomorrow night, I'm going to jump exactly 24 hours, whoop, and you'll see that the moon will still be close to Antares, but instead of above it, it'll be to the left of it. And now is probably a good time for me to teach you the next member of the zodiac. The next constellation the moon will be drifting through this is Sagittarius. Well, Sagittarius is actually a word in Greek that means the archer. And you can see he's shooting an arrow through a bow. But this character is a centaur, which is a little confusing because there's a separate constellation called the centaur. So that a lot of times this confuses people. But this particular centaur, Sagittarius, is the centaur named Chiron. And he is the trainer of heroes like uh, Percy Jackson in that famous series of books by Rick Riordan in the movies, too. He was played by Pierce Brosnan in one of those movies. But you will not see Pierce Brosnan in the stars tonight when you look for Sagittarius. In fact, you will actually have a hard time seeing even that picture I showed you of the centaur holding the bow and arrow. What you will see instead is, well, anybody who's been to my planetarium shows will have recognized this old, well-worn joke. But here in these stars is something short and stout. Here is the handle, and here is the spout. So tip me over and pour me out, because that looks a lot like a little teapot. Here's the top. Here's the spout. Here are the stars that make the bottom. And here's the handle. And even though that's not an official constellation, it's very much what we call an asterism. This is the easiest way to find Sagittarius. So this is tomorrow night's full moon. And then as the moon begins to wane, we will see that it will pass right over the top of the teapot and then through Sagittarius. And then it will make a rendezvous with the planets that will be coming up later in the season that we'll be able to see like Jupiter and Saturn, and then Mars. But because you have to stay up past midnight to see them tonight, I don't recommend it. But if you are up past midnight, you will start to see those other planets. But you don't have to stay up that late to see the full moon. That's where it's going to be tonight. So let's stop this for just a second. Because if you've watched our previous shows about full moons, I talked about all the different traditional names for the moons. And the last full moon in May was the flower moon. Well, look what happened outside since the flower moon bloomed. Well, it's, it's crazy with flowers. Everything seems to be blooming at the exact same time. My lilacs, my apples, my plums, uh, everything is happening all at once. And then we have this one called the buck moon. Now, maybe those of you familiar with deer will auto automatically know why we call this the buck moon. But if you live in a city and you live in town and you're not familiar with the life cycle of white-tailed deer that we have all around, the eastern part of North America, these animals, the males, the bucks, they grow antlers. The females, the does, they don't grow antlers. But the bucks' antlers fall off every winter after they have their, you know, mating ritual, WrestleMania, uh, the rut, as we call it. That's during hunting season in November. When that ends, those antlers, dead weight, fall off. And then a healthy buck will start to grow a new set of antlers right now during june i don't know how much the timing coincides with the full moon but it is during this month that if you see a buck running around outside you will notice that its flat head will start having these little nubs covered in velvet and for those of you who have not seen white-tailed deer with velvet antlers i've got a picture loaded up on google image search right here this is what white-tailed deer look like when their antlers are growing those antlers are bone and they require blood and they are coated with skin and a little bit of fur. It's kind of, kind of grody. And if you look at this picture over here, you can see what happens by the time fall comes. All, all summer long, the skin and the fur on the antlers is supplying nutrients to keep those bones growing. And then after they're done growing, the skin, the velvet, dries and dies and peels off and it looks all shredded and the deer go and rub their antlers on trees helping to get that stuff off and also leave their scent behind to let the ladies know they're around 
And so one of the most interesting things about white-tailed deer is this strange growth cycle. I always think it resembles trees growing on their heads. And just like the leaves on our trees, they fall off and grow back, hopefully bigger every year. So that's why we call it the buck moon. And I hope that you will get a chance to see a buck this summer with its velvety antlers. They're quite astounding and it's a beautiful sight. But one more thing I want to mention before we go is that just this weekend on Saturday past, America had a great milestone in our history for space exploration. Something happened here that has never happened before. And uh, it, it was the big launch of the SpaceX rocket that had two astronauts inside. This is the first time that a SpaceX rocket has had humans on board. And the mission with NASA and SpaceX collaborating was called DM2. And I can happily say that everything about this mission so far has been a great success. And the astronauts, Bob Bemkin and Doug Hurley, are now crew members on Expedition 63 on the International Space Station. So you can actually see this spacecraft, the Crew Dragon. It's attached to the International Space Station for at least the next 100 days or so. And both of them together are easy to spot in the sky, especially if you use a website that NASA has called Spot the Station. So first, let me just show you a quick couple of pictures that are highlights of the mission. Let's see here. This is, let's see if I can uh, make everybody see this. This is the mission patch for DM2 or Demo2. It was meant to happen on Wednesday a week ago, but they had to reschedule it because of, of weather. And it ended up happening a little after three on Saturday. And these are the two astronauts that bravely rode in a spacecraft that had never carried humans before. Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley are also astronauts from the space shuttle generation. So they flew the last American-made spacecraft. And since 2011, the, the space shuttle has been retired. So uh, no American spacecraft has taken humans into space. We've been relying on the Russian Soyuz technology, which is very reliable, but very expensive and uh, at least 40 years old. So it was pretty cool that SpaceX designed this new capsule and new spacesuits. Come on, check it out. They look like something out of the movies that I grew up watching, like 2001 and uh, Alien. They, these look like sci-fi space suits, and our science fiction is now becoming our science fact. Well, if you were able to watch some of the launch, there's a four-hour launch video available on YouTube. The SpaceX channel has all of the details, but you can see the astronauts suiting up like medieval knights. You can see them walking down that gangplank to get inside the Crew Dragon, and the inside of that capsule is filled with touch screens. It doesn't look like the old buttons and switches of the 20th century uh, spacecraft. There's Doug Hurley, also a Marine Corps test pilot. And he's from nearby Appalachian, New York. And there's Bob Benkin, he's from Missouri, and he comes to NASA from the Air Force. So these are both military veterans and astronaut veterans. And these are the two men that bravely took the Crew Dragon up to the International Space Station. And that's what it looked like sitting inside that brand new spacecraft. Check it out, touch screens. Right, it looks like seconds. a Tesla car. <laughs> I won't make you watch the whole launch, but maybe I'll just skip to the, the big moment. Rises the new era of American space. Just to squeeze, squeeze through all of this. The first stage, the second stage, detached, and then several hours later, nearly a day later, 19 hours later, the two gentlemen riding inside of that capsule docked to the International Space Station. And even though they had manual control and they could move it with the joystick or however they fly this thing, uh, they actually were able to use the autopilot. It's all by the function. And this spacecraft is under its own control. It's an individual sign. Space station. Now you might look at a slow and calm process, but remember that the spaceships are both moving 7,500 miles an hour. And here comes the first time that the Dragon is taking the space station, and maybe the other astronauts that were already up there uh, to, to uh, greet them. So. All together, here's the crew that's there up in space. Anatoly Avanishin and Ivan Wagner are Russian cosmonauts. Chris Cassidy is a NASA astronaut. 
Bob Bianken and Doug Durley, uh, uh, Doug Hurley, excuse me, are also NASA astronauts, and now they're all together up there. So how can you watch them? How can you see them? Well, let me show you the last thing I'm going to show you today, the Spot the Station website that NASA has made. All you've got to do is punch in your zip code, and you will find out when's the next time you can see the space station. So spot the station here is what it looks like. And I've already punched in St. Johnsbury because that's where the Fairbanks Museum is located. St. Johnsbury, Vermont. And if you punch in that location, you can see that tonight at 9.05, and this is very exact, at exactly 9.05, if you go outside and you look 11 degrees above the Western horizon, which is kind of low, but not too low to not be able to see it. Just look above the trees in the West and you might see a bright dot moving very quickly. It'll be visible for only four minutes. It will peak at 18 degrees above the horizon and then it'll disappear into the South. And just imagine that that spaceship that you saw is going 17,500 miles an hour. It's got five people on board. It's been orbiting the earth successfully without ever needing to be abandoned for 20 years continuously. And it's pretty cool to be able to see it. And then you get to feel like you're a part of this historic mission. So check it out. You have the full moon. You have the space station. Enjoy all these sights in the sky. And uh, tune in next week till we talk about what else is going on up above. So thank you, Leela. Uh, this might be the last time we see Leela as a host, so I'm very sorry to say that. I'll be hosting myself. We won't get to see Leela's serene smiling face anymore during our Zoom conferences. And otherwise, everyone, be well, stay safe, and keep looking up. Did any questions float in from the ether there, Leela? Uh, no questions. We had some attendees, but I think uh, they are so enthralled with what you said that <laughs> they're, <Yeah>. they're silent. <laughs> napping oh. under an apple tree, maybe. No, just kidding. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. and always exciting to get to learn a little more about the night skies from you so appreciate it and uh yeah this might be our last time online together but we'll see oh, you in the future. i'll miss you and i'll still see you around but uh at least i'll see you in person and not in pixels yes <laughs> very true <laughs> all right all right take care yeah. everyone bye bye